We welcome you to the Presbyterian Church of Morristown. Welcome to worship. Uh, this is the fourth Sunday in Advent. The Bungie and the Allison family will be leading us in the lighting of the candles. Come, O light of the world, shine in the darkness. O rise in dawn, we greet you. The silent word is pleading for us sinners even now. All we must do is lay down our burdens before the King of Kings and receive the salvation he brings to us. And so with hope and joy, let us confess before God and one another using our unison prayer. Let us pray. God who is with us, and God who is on the way, we confess that we do not wait or watch for you. Works of darkness encumber and distract us. We have ceased to hope for peace and harmony among the nations or for security apart from the defenses we construct. We fear losing what we have 
and turn away from those who struggle with daily needs. We hear your promises, Lord, but dare not trust them. God of power and love, awaken us to hope and fit us for your service. Amen. Hear now our assurance of pardon. Come, let us return to God. We have been broken, but God has healed us. We have been stricken, but God has found our wounds. The coming of God revives us and raises us up to life. Let us therefore press onward to know our God. Good morning. I am wearing another necklace today. This one is another name for Jesus. This one is called Savior. And on the other side, it says Christ the Lord. Jesus is God's son. In our Bible story today, we hear that the angels went to see the shepherds. The shepherds were the first people to hear about Jesus' birth. Shepherds didn't have a lot of money and they didn't have a lot of power and they were just regular people. They weren't famous. They weren't well known to the world. But God wanted everyone and everywhere to know the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Just as the shepherds spent their life caring for sheep, Jesus was sent here by God to care for all of us. God wanted Jesus to save us, just like the shepherds would save the sheep. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the good news of Jesus. We eagerly await the day of his birth and when he will come again. Help us to be ready. Help us to be kind, to love one another, and to care for our earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me in our prayer for illumination. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today's reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there is with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be holy and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. According to Luke, the angels say, for to you is born this day in the city of David a savior, who is Christ the Lord. What kind of savior is he? Who did he come to save? And why in the world in the Gospel of Luke are the shepherds the first to hear the news? I ran across a hymn a few years ago. It goes like this. Where shepherds lately knelt and kept the angel's word, I come in half belief a pilgrim strangely stirred. But there is room and welcome there for me. But there is room and welcome there for me. The image is you look and you see that scene, and of all people, why are there shepherds kneeling at the manger? When I was in seminary, I took a course called Spoken Word and Worship with Dr. Beaners. It was a course for aspiring ministers to learn how to read scripture as well as how to lead a service of worship. 
You'd prepare something, come before your class and read it, and then the class and Dr. Beaners would tear you apart. It was one of my favorite classes. One time he asked me to read the story from Luke, what was read today, chapter two, the very familiar story of the birth of Jesus. Well, I didn't really prepare very much. I read it as fast as I could. Uh, I didn't prepare and I did that before the, uh, the class. When I was done, Dr. Beaner said, Ed, sit down. He said, it must have been crowded there in the manger. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, because you just said, and there was Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Manger's not that big. You need a comma somewhere in that line. It reminded me of the fact that it's a very important story, but it's very different from the, uh, the story which is in Matthew. Beaners went on to say that the stories are, he divided the people up this way. In Matthew's gospel, and I'm gonna talk about Matthew's gospel on Christmas Eve, but he used to say that they are fingertip people. He said they ascertain things in, in Matthew. They search diligently. For example, they're wise men, they're smart guys. They would look up in the sky and, and they were educated. Even King Herod, who wasn't a very nice person, would use his finger to say, go search diligently for the child. And those priests who had sent the wise men to go to Bethlehem, they were pretty smart too, fingertip people. And then Beaners went on to say, but in Luke, they're feet people. These are common people. The shepherds aren't even in the city, they're outside. They're gonna come trudging into the city and they're gonna kneel down and they're gonna be dirty, why would Luke choose them first? Do you believe that the love of God is titrated out to only a couple of people, those who think that they are worthy and deserving? Or did Jesus come for all people? That I think is what Luke is wrestling with. And that's why it's shepherds who come in the Gospel of Luke. In the history of Christianity, I think we sometimes look at this two ways. One is that Jesus came for the deserving ones, the smart ones, the good people, the people who look like me. And something happened in the life of the church which underlined that sometimes in a very sinister way. I think it was in the 300s AD that Constantine, the emperor, decided it would be a good time for Christianity to be the state religion and not the outlaw religion. And that would sound like a good idea. The problem is once the Christians became rich and famous, they became powerful and they lorded it over other people. And then we would become things like crusaders, inquisitors. And we go about our lives sometimes being sure that we were the ones closest to God. We were the ones kneeling and the other people wouldn't. There is a painting in Florence, it's called the Adoration of the Magi. It was done by a Renaissance painter named Gonzelli. Now, Florence at that time was run by the Medicis. They had all the money, they were the richest in the world. If you look at this big painting, it's on a church wall, it's a whole entourage of people going up a hill to worship Jesus. But the painter knew what he was doing. He made that the three wise men were painted like different Medicis of the past. And what people would look and say, oh, I didn't realize that one of the wise men looked like Cosimo de' Medici. They weren't stupid, but what they believed was only the rich and smart and powerful people were the ones who got to the manger. I've been reading a book by Ibram Kendi, uh, which is entitled Stamp from the Beginning, and it's about a history of racist ideas. And the part I didn't understand but now do was uh, as he looks at the Puritan preacher Cotton Mather and our rather ambivalent uh, President Jefferson, that we in America and maybe all over the world have this kind of hierarchy of race uh, that we believe that there's some up high and some down low and it got read into the Bible as if God was selecting certain people who would be closest to Jesus at the manger. You know, when I was a teenager, uh, the movie King of Kings came out, which I thought was great. It was the first movie that I recall when they actually had a, an actor who you looked at, he was an actor, you could see him uh, face on. And it was Jeffrey Hunter, a great actor. The, the interesting thing was uh, his skin color was the same as mine. He had sandy color hair and a couple times, I swear his hair was blonde and he had blue eyes. He was my Jesus. 
And then a couple of years later, it was an Italian director named Pasolini came out with a, a movie entitled The Gospel According to St. Matthew. All the dialogue was in uh, Italian, but it was just a verbatim from the Gospel of Matthew. But his Jesus was an Italian who didn't have white skin, had dark hair, and he didn't look like Jeffrey Hunter, and a lot of people hated the movie. We co-opt Jesus. We turn him into ourselves. And we think that salvation only comes for people who look like us, think like us, love like us. We think that Jesus only came for the rich and the powerful, the people who know they deserve it. And that's the last thing that the Gospels say. You see, all the Gospels say that Jesus came on earth to save people and that he was not there to shore up the status quo, but to challenge it. That the kingdom of God was not going to be this kingdom or the Roman kingdom, but that God had a plan for us which was much more than we could ever hope for and that his love was given to all people. Now, all the Gospels say that, but Luke says it in spades. That's why they are shepherds. In Luke's gospel, he was writing probably to people who were not Jewish. He was writing to Roman citizens through the empire. He's got two books. It's the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. He starts in Jerusalem and it ends in Rome. He believes that Jesus came for everyone. And you can see it throughout his gospel. There's a genealogy in Luke. It doesn't start with Abraham, it starts with Adam. When Mary is thinking about what this baby's gonna be like in her womb, she says that the baby is coming to lift up the downtrodden and the poor and to bring down the mighty and the rich. The parables in Luke are told differently. In Matthew, when it's the story, you know, the sheep that's over there, the reason the sheep's over there and the shepherd has to go after him is because he's gone astray. Not in Luke, he's lost. He never knew where he was before. In Luke's gospel, Jesus came for the lost, the people on the outside, the prostitutes. He's got a name for a tax collector. His name is Zacchaeus. In the most beloved parable about what it means to be a neighbor, it's only in Luke. In the Good Samaritan, it points out that the person who loves his neighbor as himself is not the priest or the Levite, it's the enemy, it's the Samaritan. And in probably the most beloved of all the parables in Luke, the parable of the prodigal son, it's really about two lost sons. It's only in Luke. And the elder brother thinks he deserves it. He's been there the whole time. He doesn't understand what his father's love's really about. The prodigal, who spent some time eating corn cobs in a pigsty, comes back realizing he doesn't deserve the father's love, but the father embraces him. You know, even if you look at the crucifixion scenes, in Matthew and Mark, Jesus says in anguish, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's the only thing he says. In John's gospel, of course he says at the end, it's accomplished. But in Luke's gospel, it's always about reconciliation. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Thomas Cahill, in his wonderful book about Jesus, says that think about it. The last words that Jesus says on earth to a human being are to a penitent thief, and it's only in Luke. And he says, and this is what Cahill says, something that we all long to hear sometime. Today you'll be with me in paradise. In Luke's gospel, nothing's titrated. He loves everybody. And there's room around the manger for the shepherds, the foot people. I used to have a church in upstate New York. It was at the crossroads of two um, county highways. And it was in the center square, it was on a square. And uh, on a particularly really hot August morning, it was vacation Bible school Sunday, so we made the kids bring their parents, so it was packed that day. 
we didn't have air conditioning so the windows were open and the doors were open and from where I preached and it was much like this sanctuary you could look down the middle aisle as I looked out in that door came a man who looked sort of disturbed he was barefoot and in that particular location I used to get what we used to call hobos all the time and I was able to help them but I didn't know what was going to happen with this man he walks in and he's walking around the North X and I was hoping he wouldn't come into the sanctuary just because I wanted to finish my sermon. But he decides to go up to the balcony and I had a couple of really good ushers that day so they followed him. Didn't want to make a concern, but anyway, he went up and then he eventually went to the right hand, my right hand of the, of the uh, balcony, went over and he sat on the railing with his feet dangling over. I kept preaching, I don't know how I did, but I didn't want anybody else to see. He wasn't there long. He went on the other side and sort of knelt next to the railing. Well, I finished the sermon and uh, I didn't want to pull him out. I figured he'd take care of it afterwards. And then it was time for us to celebrate communion. I said the words of institution. I gave the bread to the elders. They went around, they went up to him. And when they came to him, he looked at it and he grabbed a handful and he ate them. And then when we brought the cup up, he took six of them and lined them along the railing like he was at a bar and drank them down like shots. But it struck me, that was the most extraordinary communion I had ever experienced. He didn't know what I was talking about. He was probably delirious at that time. But he was hungry and he had been fed. He was thirsty and he had something to drink. Later on, he was someone who had overdosed on his medication, got away from the group home, and they took him back. But it struck me that if that had happened 2,000 years ago and Luke had heard the story, I bet he would have included it in the gospel. Because that man who was kneeling at my railing had been fed by Jesus, and he was supposed to be kneeling there. And so, the angels say to the shepherds, for to you is born a savior who is Christ the Lord, a savior who came for all people. The last verse in that hymn goes like this. Can I, will I forget the love that was born and burned inside of me that was unasked, unforced, unearned? And it goes on to say, to live and die, but not alone for me. To live and die and not alone for me. Do you believe that God's love's that great? Do you believe that there's room at the manger for the shepherds to kneel? Do you believe there's room for you and me? Amen. Let us now open our hearts and minds in prayer to God. Glory to you, O God, in highest heaven. We worship and praise you for the gift you gave us, are still giving us, and will always give us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Prepare our hearts anew for his coming and ground us in your love. Eternal God, we pray for the world that our warring ways may be overturned even now through the birth death and resurrection of Christ, for nothing is impossible with you. Fill our hearts with your peace until it overflows to all the ends of the earth. We pray for the mission of your church, that we may proclaim the good news of the age as we rejoice in the gift of our Savior. Make us bold in our proclamation and compassionate in our witness as we continue to fast from in-person worship and gatherings for the sake of public health, open our hearts and minds in fresh ways to your presence and your leading. We pray for your creation, that we may safeguard its well-being from generation to generation to your honor and glory. As the cold winter weather settles in upon us, 
Awaken us to the lessons the natural world has to teach us. Renew our fatigued spirits with the fallowness and rest inherent to this season of creation. We pray for all who suffer, that we may feed the hungry and lift up the lowly through the power of your holy and life-giving spirit. In these days when the need in our communities only grows, equip us to redouble our efforts to reach out to our neighbors with support and care. Help us to see both those waiting in food lines or lying on benches and those who stand in the shadows with needs that are less visible but no less real, like those with mental illness or addictions. We remember before you those who have died and pray for those who will die today, that they may rest with you eternally in your kingdom where there is no end. Our hearts ache with the sobering milestone of 300,000 dead in just our own country from COVID-19. Surround all who are grieving in these days with your compassionate love. We need your sustaining hope so much, gracious one. Free us from fear and anxiety and the limits they place upon us. Pour out your spirit upon those near and dear to us, upon Les, Grace, and Linda, Charles and Debbie, and all those we name before you now. Be with those who are isolated or lonely and those separated from family and friends. Lift up all those who feel bowed down this day, O Lord. Through Christ, with Christ in the unity of the Holy Spirit, we magnify you, almighty God, forever and ever and entrust all our cares to you as we join our hearts and voices in the prayer our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And Luke, when he thought of Jesus who had died and risen some 50 or 60 years before him, who he envisioned on the cross, knew that Jesus didn't just come for the chosen few, he came for everyone. And that God's love is not titrated out just to a few. It is abundant for all people. So go in peace and be of good courage and follow our Lord Jesus Christ, if you dare. Amen.